welcome to The Untold with Haiti Buzo. Joining me today is uh, the youngest Israeli Knesset member from the Likud party, Sharon Haskell, who is joining us today from Tel Aviv. And we will be uh, talking about her role uh, in the Likud, making some steps that were viewed as controversial in the Likud party, and um, seeing her views on peace uh, possibilities in the Middle East, uh, the Israeli relations with uh, neighboring countries, and the Iran question. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I do kind of want to circle back to um, first congratulate you on the formation of the coalition government in Israel. That was a major thing that happened after three historical elections. Yes, um, that was a very crazy year and a half that we had to deal with. Um, It's never happened in the history of Israel. And obviously the people were quite divided. Uh, And because three times in a row, the people of Israel wouldn't uh, make a clear decision between the left and the right, we had no choice but to go into a unity government and take some from the left and some from the right and form this government. Um, Mm -hmm. It's challenging. None of us is completely happy with it. But we understand we are facing also an economical crisis, a health crisis. And so we have to look after our people and after our country. Uh, And so we made quite a lot of compromises Mm -hmm. um, in in order to form this government. Can you explain a little bit about why not everybody is happy with it? Um, It's easy. (laughs) Um, Obviously, um, uh, our side, the right wing side, uh, the more conservative, the more liberal, Um, You know, we want to push forward uh, a a right ideological agenda throughout uh, economical issues, throughout uh, individual liberties, uh, regards safety and security, uh, security of our borders as well. And so um, if we are holding a right wing government, we are able to advance what we believe is right for our country and our people. Now, blue and white are from the left side of the map. They have Are they left or are they more center? My understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is more of a center right wing coalition. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell me. Yeah, I mean, when you look on their economical policies, for example, um, the head of Israel's unions uh, was running with this party. Uh, Avi Nisankon. Um, he's now the Minister of Justice here in Israel. He's holding a left-wing ideological agenda in regards to uh, our court system, in regards to unions, to, uh, uh, to organized labor and workforces. Um, so this is completely different from the right-wing side as well, and it collides. Um, we already had quite a few arguments, not just him, but many more people in his agenda that feels the same as he does uh, are holding now position like the economy ministry, um, the uh, farming, um, agricultural ministry as well. So obviously there's quite a lot of collisions between the policies that we want to pass and the policies that they want to pass. And also on, on, on safety and security and borders, we don't see eye to eye. So and how does blue and white view those issues in terms of security, in terms of national security threats and uh, foreign policy? As a left-wing party, um, it's not, you know, there's obviously some differences running from member to member of parliament. But in general, they're holding a more appeasing kind of um, approach orientation. And the right wing is sort of holding a more security and safety uh, approach and ideology. And so that collides sometimes as well. Um, their uh, party uh, group that uh, joined with them is the Labour Party as well, which is a left-wing party. They have already spoken in the media um, uh, about opposing uh, the Trump plan as well. Of course, yeah, the Labour Party has spoken about the refusal of what is called the deal of the century. Yeah, and they're going together in the same group with blue and white. 
So they joined the coalition as part of Blue and White Party. But so, does Blue and White um, support the deal that is being um, presented by the American administration? Or does Blue and White also agree with the labor component in the coalition? So um, part of the coalition agreement that they put in, um, so uh, we had to accept, and probably almost the only uh, a term that we put on the coalition agreement is to go through with the Trump plan. Uh, so putting that plan on the map as a condition to the coalition agreement, they had to agree with it before we formed the government. Now, they said they, some, the leadership put some voices of supporting it. Some of the people in the party are opposing it. Um, but in the recent few days, you can hear them toning down, saying, we have no choice about the Trump plan. This is part of the coalition agreement. So they have to agree to it, and we will pass it. Before we go into in-depth about these issues concerning the peace plan, annexation, and the, the Iran question, the Arab neighbors, I do want to go back to talk about the fact that you were one of the few members of the Likud party who basically supported Benjamin Netanyahu's contender, Gidon Saad, at one point. That was a controversial step, but you took it and you said, this is Israel's democracy. You needed to do what you needed to do because there was all of these, you know, continuation of re-elections that you felt that this was the right thing to do. How do you view now Benjamin Netanyahu being the serving uh, prime minister after the coalition? And is the Likud party reunited? around him? So I'm really um, proud and I do not regret the choices that I've made in supporting Gidon Saab. Um, I do believe that for the right wing camp that would have been the best choice. Um, unfortunately, 70% uh, of my party chose not to. Well, we won 30% of the, of the votes. Um, and in that term, I, you know, I believe in democracy. Uh, once this has been uh, uh, decided, I respect the choice of, the, of my party members. Um, and we completely, all of us, including Gidon Sa, uh, supported Prime Minister Netanyahu throughout the campaign, the national campaign that we went through. Um, we still support and back him up, um, obviously, as any individual in the politics, uh, you know, I'm very opinionated <laughs> and I'm very ideological. Um, so, um, you know, when, when you need to say the good things and, and do support and certain reforms, you do that. And you, if you have some criticism, you do that as well. But those primaries are definitely behind us and we are now concentrating on how to advance Israel forward. And I mean, it is also historical, talking about Israel's democracy, there is the, also the trial now that Benjamin Netanyahu is going through. And this is also probably the first time in Israel that a serving prime minister would be um, on trial at the same time. Uh, what are your views on this? You know, what, what are the prospects of this case? The first one is um, every individual is uh, uh, innocent until proven guilty or until proven otherwise. Um, though, so that's the first thing. And if it applies to any citizen, it definitely applies to the prime minister as well. Um, I hope, I really hope that he'll be able in the trial to clear his name. Um, there's many questions surrounding that which are very in-depth um, Israeli issues that are starting to float up. Um, and this is the trust of the people in the democratic um, uh, foundations of Israel. Now, when we're talking uh, about our uh, legal system, about our judicial system, we're talking about the enforcement police officers as well, uh, the police in Israel. Uh, when we talk about journalists as well, uh, the media is getting a lot of heat, a lot of criticism, and the parliaments as well, um, uh, leadership. Uh, so government, parliament, uh, representatives of the people, all of those foundations that are basically there uh, uh, as a democratic structure for our country Unfortunately, we see a huge decline in the trust of the people. 
I think the, there's certain, there's obviously a lot of allegations that have to be looked into. Certain things had to be fixed 30 years ago. Israel's a young country. And so I'm sure that when the American founding fathers um, formed America, they had a lot of issues that they had to solve slowly through the years. But America is quite uh, a, a historical and a, uh, very has have a very long history and is a very old now democratic nation as well. Um, Israel is still young. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we do certain reforms that are going to bring back the trust of the people in the system. The trial is not helping um, because there's more and more distrust among all of them. Uh, and it's unfortunate. Uh, about the functional, um, the, func the, um, uh, the work of the Prime Minister, um, I've seen Bibi in many situations. Um, when he's pushed to the wall, he's functioning even better. Now, in the last two years were very difficult years. He was serving as a Prime Minister full-time, also as a Foreign Minister full-time, uh, some of the most amount of uh, delegations that were there that were happening in Israel and outside of Israel. Um, so the, our foreign relationships were flourishing. Um, and he was still functioning really well as a prime minister while the very difficult part of the trial was going on, which is investigations and interrogations and, and things like that. Um, the actual trial obviously will take his, some of his attention as well. Um, but seeing him how he worked for the last two years, I have confidence that he'll still be able to uh, function uh, well. If anyone's capable of doing that, it's Netanyahu. When you talk about uh, the division within Israel that is currently happening, it, does it echo what's happening in the United States? The like left is becoming more far left. The gap is getting bigger. At least this is what we see, this is what we hear. Um, the media, there's all these questions that are happening in the United States. Is it similar to what's happening in Israel? Um, some processes are similar and some are, are probably different. Um, the media and social media definitely um, give a, a very high stage or a loud speaker uh, to extreme voices that I see them as small minorities. Um, those extreme right and extreme left voices are definitely loud and they get all the attention in social media and they get all the attention in the uh, um, general media, uh, television, radio, newspapers. Um, you know, they get all the publicity they need because it sells. Uh, it sells the news, it sells the newspaper, uh, people are watching it, it's interesting. But to be honest, these are very small minorities. Um, I see the vast majority of the people in Israel, and from what I've seen in America as well, they're not holding any of those extreme sites or extreme ideology. Uh, most of the people from left and from right are angry at them as well, uh, where in their names, they are actually taking extreme actions that doesn't represent them. Um, and unfortunately, it creates a, t a tear, a, a gap between left and right. Um, but you know what? We have left and right in every family here in Israel. You have left and right in every family in the United States. We sit around the table during holidays, and we talk politics and it's okay. It doesn't have to come uh, to curses, to violence or anything. Well, sometimes like it does. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, when we are out in the streets and sometimes either in a forum or we're talking to strangers, I think just try and imagine this is like your family member that just disagree with you, you know, and, and it's okay. We accept the other opinion uh, we, uh, and, and we can say what we believe and what we think is right, our own opinion. I mean, this is the most important thing, to voice it, to speak it out. Um, if someone feel like they can't speak out what they believe is right, that's worrying. 
if someone's afraid to say his own political view, not, not even an extreme one, that's not a good place. Freedom of speech is so important. And the more we talk about our opinions, the more we talk about our ideology, about what we think is right, the more this gap is going to start narrowing down and closing down. And people will start communicating and understanding each other. I think many people here in Israel, and also from what I've seen in America as well, are too afraid to say their own opinion because people are acting quite violent and are shutting them down based on either the way that they said it or uh, a how could you say something like that. I mean, it's okay. Just accept it. People don't have to have a filter for everything that they feel or for everything that they experience. Uh, you just talk about it. And if it seems not right, talk about it. Don't attack. Don't shut them down. And from what, what I've seen in campuses, in, in some campuses in America, it seems like some students won't want to give the right of speech to certain groups on, on campuses as well. And that, sh I think, should worry. We're not there. We can still close those gaps, uh, but we have to talk about it. It's absolutely a, a true statement about uh, what's happening in terms of universities and the fact that there is a silent majority. I think this also uh, could be echoed uh, here in the United States where we have this issue. Um, I do want to move to Iran. And um, we know that Israel, under Benjamin Netanyahu, has been conducting airstrikes against Iranian militias in Syria, for example, where um, Israel has lifted the price for Iran to stay. And we know that um, now Iran is actually uh, moving its proxies towards the north, where they are still being targeted by Israel. And there are uh, some reports that uh, Iran is considering leaving Syria because it's really costly. And we know that the campaign by the American administration to sanction Iran has also uh, worked against the Iranian regime. How do you view those policies by Israel towards Iran um, continuing now with this coalition government? And would we see any, um, ba basically, a contrast between how Benjamin Netanyahu handles and sees this uh, threat and uh, Benny Gantz? It's a, it's a very complicated situation. Um, Iran has based itself for years in Lebanon, and that created a huge security challenge for Israel. And so when Iran was tr starting to use Syria as a proxy for its violent uh, and aggressive uh, uh, purposes and attacks, uh, it sort of weighed for us a red flag as well. And we said, uh, Syria is not going to be the second Lebanon. Um, I cannot confirm most of the, uh, the attacks that's been done in Syria, and we cannot talk too much about it, um, but we are committed to make sure that Iran doesn't base itself in Syria in any kind of mean. This is a serious existential threat for my country and for my people. This is my family, my friends that we need to protect. Um, it seems like slowly we're succeeding. We're still far away from that, from achieving it completely, um, but it is going on the way. Um, Iran is a violent regime. Uh, it's an aggressive, uh, uh, has an aggressive leadership um, that is wanting to take over land and over people. It's got a few proxies around the Middle East uh, where we've seen some of the most violent conflict we've seen in decades. Um, and all of that, while Iranian people are poor, are starving, have no food, have climate uh, 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 tragedies that are happening all around the country, they don't care about them. They are investing all the money instead of helping their people in more and more weapon aggressiveness, and war. And this is bad news for our region. Our region have been, have seen some of the most violent and terrible wars we've seen in, in decades. 
the only force that's continuing to push this engine is Iran. They are behind all of that. Um, we've seen some demonstration in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in, even in Iran, starting to oppose that regime. It's not enough. It's going to take time. Um, but here in Israel, we, we understand that. Um, a lot, some of the um, Islamic countries in the Middle East understand that as well. It took them a while, but they do understand that. Um, I hope we will work in cooperation. Um, at the end of the day, it's a mutual goal to have peace and stability in our region, that all of our people will be able to prosper. Um, but we're still far away from that. We're still far away, unfortunately, uh, but we keep our eye open. Um, by the way, we still have quite a big challenge with Lebanon as well. Obviously and I was going to ask you about this because uh, I've had Elon Berman on the show, uh, my previous episode, and he said, when I asked him about the tensions in Northern Israel with Hezbollah, he said, the war with Hezbollah is coming. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And we keep our eyes open. Um, this is a proxy of Iran, Hezbollah. Uh, everybody knows that. They're funding all of their activity. They're giving them instructions. And they're controlling the country. Um, they're controlling the government. Um, and the Lebanese people seem like they're starting to have, you know, sick and tired of, of that. Um, there's a huge economical crisis right now in Lebanon. Uh, you know, the, uh, the amount of the uh, money, Lebanese money, have risen uh, extremely in comparison to the dollar because of terrible management. And this is all in the, uh, you know, Hezbollah, Hezbollah's leadership. Um, and Hezbollah is starting to target Israel you know, as its uh, enemy and as sort of a stress relief uh, for the tension, for the demonstrations, for the criticism that they have against the government. I mean, obviously, it's easy. It's all because of Israel. Just blame Israel and everything will disappear. It doesn't seem to be working, though, for Hezbollah anymore. People don't believe that, that blame game that Hezbollah has been playing along with it. It's all of the Iranian uh, like that, proxies. But I, but I believe that if Hezbollah is going to go down, it's going to do everything in order to take Israel with it. And so we're expecting it. They already started some tensions on the borders as well, uh, some social media campaigning and, and things like that in order to distract uh, the people uh, from the economical crisis and from the demonstrations as well. Um, I mean, Lebanon can be an incredible country. It was the uh, European capital of the Middle East with art, with uh, theater, with shoppings, with everything. People used to come as tourists there. Um, and it can still be there, but they have to get rid, rid of those extreme and corrupted uh, leadership. And yeah, and that's been holding them hostages because we know also in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah hides behind and under people, like civilians and children. They build the bunkers underneath those buildings. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're building bases. They're building bunkers. They're building tunnels into Israel. And it all comes from those villages. They are using them as human shields. Um, and so obviously we, you know, we're ready, we're expecting it. Um, there's probably going to be another round, uh, depending on how bad the government situation is going to be. They're going to try and pull as much tension towards Israel instead of towards them. Um, and we'll be ready, as we always do. <laughs> you grew up in an area called Kafar Sava, which uh, is a Labour Party stronghold. Uh, traditionally, and uh, you joined a peace camp, uh, etc. And then you kind of shifted towards the right as um, you grew up. And I wanted to understand how did that transition happen and you, your decision to join the Likud party. So obviously it was a process um, from the time when I was growing up, I was a teenager, um, and uh, the Israeli leadership promised us many things. They promised peace, 
They promised us stability. Um, they promised us that if only we give up land um, and we go towards the Oslo Accord, that's when peace will finally come because those extremes that were uh, initiating all the violence and the war won't have a reason to fight Israel anymore. And we believe in that dream. Uh, we really wanted to coexist and live side by side. But unfortunately, um, we sobered up from that dream and many uh, people of my generation that really believed um, that, um, that peace is coming um, sort of open up our, we opened up our eyes and we understood that unfortunately when the Oslo Accord came, instead of investing um, Palestinian time, money, infrastructure, um, uh, you know, the Palestinian leadership will invest all of its time in constructing and building their new autonomy that was just given to them. They actually took all of those funds and all of that time and invested it in how to create a bigger war against Israel. And that's when um, for, um, you know, Arafat, I don't know whether he uh, planned that from the start or he changed his mind along the way, um, started funding terrorist organization, suicide bombers, uh, creating bombs, uh, send, sending people, uh, sometimes children, uh, with suicide vests to restaurants, bars, uh, buses, uh, and just explode themselves and murder as many innocent uh, men, women, and children as possible. The bigger the event is, the bigger the grant will be for your family. Um, and that reality, you know, try and imagine me, uh, a 16 year old girl taking the bus to high school and you look uh, side to side to see whether there's uh, 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 someone that looks suspicious or someone that's wearing a big puffy jacket and some, sometimes you see someone suspicious and you get off the bus and you get on the next one after and you see another person of suspicion and you get off the bus and you're often late for school for your high school. I had one morning when I woke up late for school by accident, I was having my breakfast and then in Farsaba I heard a loud explosion, the house was shaking. I opened the television and I see that the bus that I was meant to take to my high school was exploded and people got murdered. Um, and when you go through a period of time like this, you understand that their aims is not peace and stability. You ask yourself, we gave them now land we gave them an autonomy. Why are they uh, hating us, killing us? Why are they opening a war? What's the reason? And you really understand that they won't settle down until there'll be no Jews in the state of Israel completely. Uh, and that's their real fight. And so when you open up your eyes to history and you see everything that happened, you see the refusal of Palestinians, you start to understand that you know, this is not a territorial conflict. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has a territorial aspect to it, but the core of that conflict is a cultural and a religious conflict. And territory is not what's gonna solve it. We have to learn to live side by side. What do you think would be the solution to change the Palestinian Authority and Hamas and Gaza that they both always trying to say, hey, we, we want to push Israel to the sea, that we do not want Israel to exist. Um, what is the alternative? What is the way to change that system that is basically yeah. rewarding terrorist activities? It's more than that. I mean, their education system is actually teaching them to racism. That's, that's their education system, teaching them to hate Jews. Um, I'll tell you what, the thing that needs to change is the Palestinian leadership. Uh, when the Palestinian leadership starts changing, when the younger generation goes out and demands something different, that's when there'll be a real change. 
Um, the Palestinian leadership, unfortunately, and, and uh, to be honest, this is the biggest tragedy for the Palestinian people. It's leadership. Time after time, they make the, the bad decisions for their people and the good decisions for themselves. Um, the money uh, that's being funneled through international organization is going straight into their pockets. They are building uh, extreme extravagant houses, uh, flying in private jets, flying with private helicopters, uh, having, you know, uh, 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 Mahmoud Abbas, the leader, the leader, is building now $17 million palace next to Ramallah, while he have almost more than 40% of the younger generation unemployed, have nothing to eat, cannot acquire education for the younger generation. You know, they live in poverty because of their leadership, because their leadership is not taking any kind of responsibility. Do you believe and this is why the leadership continues to fuel absolutely. the animosity towards Israel so they can get away with stealing or, or the corruption? From the conflict, the more, the, 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 the worse Palestinians are, the more poor they are, the more deprived they are, the more, the more money they can gather from the international community. And it doesn't funnel down to the Palestinian people, it goes to their leadership. So they are actually padding their pockets. And then when the Palestinians go and ask, oh, why don't we have infrastructures and schools and electricity and water facilities? They say it's all because of Israel. No. Israel has invested millions and millions of dollars in infrastructure when they didn't need it. The Palestinian Authority is getting hundreds of millions of dollars for in infrastructure, only it doesn't get there. It goes straight into their pockets. And so it's easy to blame Israel for all the problems of the Palestinians. The leadership's taking no responsibility at all on their people. And unfortunately, this is their biggest tragedy. When the new generation will start rising, that's when we'll start seeing change. Not a corrupt one, not a racist one, not a one that's there for their own uh, personal gain, but a, a, a real honest person who's, who wants to look after their people. When you're talking about having a prosperous, positive relationship, um, having economical uh, cooperation, this is something that is at least starting to happen with some Arab countries uh, around Israel. Tell me a little bit more about your views on those developments. And uh, how do you see this really developing, knowing that there is the Palestinian question, that there is all these other obstacles, including all of these terrorist organizations that are supported by Iran in the region, etc. How do you view these steps um, with Arab countries? So there has been relationship under the surface for many years. Um, but I think that the Obama administration really gave a certain push for, for certain Arab countries to understand that we're going to have to protect ourselves and we have to join forces against uh, my, uh, a major, bigger enemy. And that sort of security cooperation that we were able to build in order to create a little bit more stability in our region um, actually opened certain doors towards an uh, economical cooperation, uh, scientific cooperation. Um, and, you know, we are so uh, thankful for that. I mean, this is what Israel wants. Israel doesn't want war. We want to uh, work with our neighbors. We want to build bridges with our neighbors. The better their people are, the better Israeli people are. I mean, we, have, we were able to found a country that's not based on, uh, you know, on oil or natural resources, but on human resources, uh, a human brain. Um, and to be honest, uh, some of these countries, when there's also poverty, some of them are extremely rich, um, but there's a lot to do in developing the, those countries into creating them uh, a big power. 
And through cooperation, they can help Israel and we can help them as well. And those friendship and those bridges that are being built are starting to trickle down uh, to the media, to the Arab, uh, Arab uh, the Muslim world media. Um, I've seen some reporters uh, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Arabia, in so many countries starting not to necessarily speak positively about Israel, but to actually say that Israel is not the problem, which is incredible. Um, starting to talk about the real problem, which is the Palestinian refusal to any kind of solution in our region. Um, being the one who are inciting to more violence, uh, to more instability. And that's a, an incredible conversation. Um, I think the Palestinian people are the, gonna, going to be the one who are going to benefit the most from it. Um, they know the culture, they speak the language, and the more businesses that are gonna start trading or building bridges with Israel, they're gonna be a major force in that kind of economy as well. But it doesn't seem that they see that. It seems that they are the biggest uh, rejectors of um, this development that is happening. And I agree with you about talking, you know, Israel has great technological sector. It has so many different um, scientific discoveries that are happened in Israel that the whole region can benefit from. But the Palestinians are the ones who look at everybody who tries to advocate for that uh, path as traitors, as, uh, you know, calling them all types of names. Um, we saw what happened to a Saudi activist who was sped on and hit by people when he was walking towards Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, I mean, this is, this is what we see. That was a horrible situation. I actually personally sent him a message and asked him to come with me personally on the Temple Mount to have another experience, uh, you know, in, in, around there as well. I was shocked from, from, from something like that. But, you know, there's a word for that. It's like children. And it is. I mean, their leadership, we spoke about it. They don't care about the people. Uh, the worse the, the, the people are, the better is the situation for their leadership. Um, and the Palestinian people are, I mean, it's their leadership, but it trickles down to there as well. It's like children, you know, you, you, when you go, you go to the doctor, when things are not okay, uh, the, doc, you, the doctor prescribe you a bitter medicine. You don't want to take it. You don't want to swallow it. Uh, but you know what? At the end of it, it makes you feel good and healthy and that's the situation i'm not expecting them to agree with it or to uh, come to the table i mean history has already proven that they'll continue to refuse any kind of offer or any kind uh, the furthest one that you can even imagine and they'll continue to refuse it uh, so i'm not expecting them to come and sit around the table but together with the cooperation of other countries as well I think that there's a possibility for a stable and, and, uh, uh, and long lasting future for all of us together. And they're gonna have to swallow that bitter pill. Talking now about the deal of the century, the peace plan that is uh, being presented by the American administration. Um, first of all, what are your views of this deal? I know that you've said that the Likud party agrees with it, but talking about going forward, I mean, if the Palestinians are refusing to the table, what is the next step? Um, the next step is definitely sovereignty uh, around certain areas. Um, Are you talking about annexation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, tell me a little bit more about this because this is a controversial question. Some people agree with it, some people disagree with it and think this is going to make uh, Arab countries more um, embarrassed or under more pressure to become more open with Israel. How do you view this? People have many advices and it seems like we have many prophets during our days today and everybody can predict the future and what's going to happen in the future. I don't believe it. <laughs> um, I don't think we have a live prophet today. Um, but um, with that, I'll say, you know, um, we sign a peace agreement with Egypt without solving the Palestinian problem. It's not perfect, but it's working. Uh, we sign another peace agreement with Jordan. 
without solving the Palestinian problem. Um, and I do believe that we can sign more peace agreements with more Arab countries. And it seems like more of them, you know, the, the, the penny sort of drops there. They understand that it's the Palestinians that are creating the problem. It's the Palestinians that refuse to negotiate. It's the Palestinians that refuse to come to any kind of agreement or solution or anything like that. Um, and the more they realize it quicker, the, you know, the, the quicker we'll be able to maybe find a solution that is outside of the box. Um, with the sovereignty plan, um, we're basically um, annexing a big, uh, I think it was considered about 30% of it, uh, mainly where there's uh, Jewish uh, towns and villages. Um, I'm not sure the amount of Palestinians that are there. Uh, it's probably, I think, in the Jordan Valley is going to include about 8,000, 6,000 to 8,000 Palestinians. Um, around Jerusalem, there's going to be also a certain amount. I don't know the exact number because the details have not been revealed yet. Um, they are going to become Israeli citizens. and They are, they are going, going to become Israeli citizens. From what I know, I mean, this is, you mm -hmm. know, a very uh, uh, um, inform small information that we're mm -hmm. hearing here or there. Until the prime minister is going to publish it, we are not going to know the exact details. Yes. Um, but it seems like this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so finally, uh, the military is not going to be in charge there. There's going to be a government. There's going to be local councils. There are going to be proper civilian facilities in it. Um, and to be honest, obviously, the Palestinians are not going to celebrate it in the streets. Otherwise, they're going to be in prison. Uh, but deep down inside, I'm sure they're very happy with that as well. Um, so... Um, it seems like we're going towards that. Um, mm -hmm. And then Trump said that the plan is there for four years for the Palestinian to sit down around the table and start negotiating with Israel on a certain solution towards the future. Mm -hmm. You know what? We'll see what the future holds. So we're talking now about those large areas that is, they are part of the plan. And they are included in the plan that these are part of Israel. And Israel is just basically doing it before the plan is finalized while providing the solution for the Palestinians who are living around these areas. Isn't that what we're talking about? Um, so the Trump plan is not including in agreeing together with the Palestinians. It starts to open a door to negotiations. Um, until today, the Clinton initiative was the only initiative that anyone ever discussed or talked about. They said, if it's not those lines, one, two, three, four, uh, it's not going to work. Now, the Clinton initiative have failed time after time for more than 30 years, and no one even thought of starting to try a new plan. Um, actually, even when we had left wing, extreme left wing, a uh, uh, prime minister who agreed with almost everything in the Clinton initiative, the Palestinians still stood up and left to the table and refused to sign a peace agreement. So, yes, the Trump uh, administration finally, for the first time in all the international community, understood that this plan failed, put it aside, let's put something new on the table. Now, they put a, a ticking clock for the Palestinians as well. And they understood that it's the Palestinian refusal that stopped any kind of advancement in coming into a solutions between Israelis and Palestinians. So they reversed that. I'll give you an example. It was the French initiative of the president of France. He said, I want to resolve the problem in the Middle East. He started discussing a plan and he said something like this, okay, we believe that the Clinton initiative, that those lines, 67, Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this is the solution and the foundation for the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, we give Israel and the Palestinians five years to negotiate that plan. If they don't come to a solution, we will declare a Palestinian state within those terms. 
Now, what does that mean? It means that the Palestinians need to refuse any kind of negotiation with Israel. They'll sit on their hands, on their fancy chairs, and in five years, they'll receive exactly what they wanted without speaking a word with Israel. And later on, within a few years, they can ask even more. Now, the entire international community has worked like that, and Palestinians think the time is working in their benefit. The longer it takes, the more they'll get. Trump said, stop. We have to resolve it, and for that, we have to put a deadline for the Palestinians. I put four years. In the meantime, Israel can start its side of the plan. Okay, same as Sarkozy, uh, the president of France, said to the Palestinian beforehand. So the Israelis can start stepping up and can start applying uh, some of these parts without any kind of agreement. And I give the Palestinians four years for this initiative in order to sit down around the table and start negotiating directly with Israel within those terms. And you know what? If anything, I think that might help. It's uh, hard to believe because I think they'll continue to refuse it, but at least it's a thought outside of the box. At least it's something new that's coming down to the table. At least it's changing the reality, the future that we were stuck here in our region. And you know what? I bless for that. I think we're going to end this here. Um, and I would love to have you again on sometime in the future. Thank you so much, Sharon Haskell, yeah. for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and listening with you, The Untold, with Heidi Buzo. And I would love to hear your feedbacks, your thoughts, your questions. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.